Yeah, because um, if I do it by mouse, sometimes it records on my computer instead of the cloud, which messes things up. Okay, we're still working on the, the book of Hebrews. Uh, I, um, I, I went through a portion of the 11th chapter Sunday morning, but we got uh, sidetracked there with that item that we were talking about. <clears throat> there was a lot more interest in that, seemed like to me, and there was the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, uh, which was rightfully so. Um, so I won't start, I won't go all over, but he talks about all these that are all these faithful. And when he gets through talking about them, he starts off with Abel and he goes through um, all the way to the walls of Jericho, go, Jericho falling down, Rahab the harlot that um, received the spies with peace. And then in verse 32, he says, what shall I say more? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak Samson and Jephthah and David also and Samuel of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, and Meshach and Abednego, Shadrach, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness. Um, it was Meshach and Shad Shadrach and Abednego that uh, that quenched the violence of fire. Um, wasn't it Daniel that went down to the lions? Uh, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight. The armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again. That's a sh um, the uh, widow at uh, Zarephath, and then also the widow that Miss, um, Elisha raised her son from the dead. Uh, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Maybe I, if y'all want me to, I'll share the screen. Um, okay. Verse 36, and others had trial, uh, a trial of cruel mocking, scourging, shame over bonds and imprisonments. They were stoned, sawn asunder. Tempted, slain with a sword, they wandered about sheepskins, goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. <clears throat> All these having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. We've always said that you know, Matthew 27, 52 was uh, that resurrection that these faithful, that was a resurrection of the just under the early church. Um, and if I back up to verse 13, it says here, these all died, talking about those in faith, not having received the promises. But they saw, having seen them afar off, were persuaded of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So <clears throat> the writer here just lets us know that, that they, without us, without this new covenant, uh, that Jesus came. Uh, there's a scripture in... Let me try to think of this scripture that hit my mind. Second Timothy, maybe two. Uh, let me see if I can find it for you right quick. I'm wanting the scripture where he said, that he would judge the quick and the dead. Let's see if I can find that for you real quick. It's in 2 Timothy, I know. Yeah, 
Here it is, it's in 4.1. Right here, <clears throat> this scripture here, you have to think about a little bit. It says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick, that's the living, and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. That dead there, I believe you would have to, you have to discern what he's saying, but it's talking about graveyard dead. That's a resurrection. He's going to judge. He don't have to judge the dead. They're already judged. But the quick and the dead, they will come up in a restored church at his appearing or his second coming. <clears throat> when Jesus comes back in a restored church and a uh, judgment is set up, the judgment seat of Christ. There's a scripture for you to chew on just a little bit. Um, but, <clears throat> but here they're referring to this Matthew 27, 52. Uh, I think the scripture I just showed you in 2 Timothy is referring to a resurrection down here at his second coming as he's talking to Timothy, <clears throat> which is working with him in a Gentile work as Gentile apostles. Okay, verse 12, I mean, chapter 12, excuse me. Wherefore, seeing also we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, let us run with patience the race that's set before us. <clears throat> of course, any sin that's hindering you is a weight that's besetting you, but Brother Leninger always leaned on it being the sin of um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? How do you use that? Um, omission. The sin of omission. It's what you don't do that, that needed to be done. <clears throat> Let us set, run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such a contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be weary and faint in your minds. You've not resisted unto blood striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou rebuke him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. That's something I've been doing. There's been some thoughts going on in my mind just this week about chaff and the tares. I've been sort of expanding my thinking and on that. That uh, you know, if you look at a wheat stalk, it, it that wheat stalk grows up and it 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 doesn't produce fruit until the harvest. Uh, Matthew 13, concerning the, the parable of the tares, uh, the, the, ter the, the harvest is the end of the world, Jesus said. See, a lot of people want to make this harvest all down through the whole Gentile world. But I just don't see where the Bible will will uh, prove that out. I, I think you're going to have to have a restored church. But I, the reason I feel like most men see that that way is because they don't believe in a resurrection in the restored church. So somewhere they got to put it that you can overcome sin, and they don't want to just wait till the end of the world because if they die before the restored church, then they don't have an opportunity to make the bride if you can only make the bride at that time. But if they see a resurrection of the just in the restored church, 
And that broadens the spectrum of many more bride members than what they allow because it's going to allow <clears throat> so many just to resurrect no matter when <clears throat> they resurrect in or when they lived in the Gentile world. See, they're saying only just a very few could make the bride during the uh, Gentile world during the Dark Ages. But what about all those that lived a just life? And if God gave everyone under the law that died by faith and were justified by faith, and they were just, and he gave them a, a resurrection to uh, uh, come up to receive the Holy Ghost and enter the new covenant and overcome sin, they without us could not be made perfect. <clears throat> of course, there are, we still have even a greater division since we came together with the brethren, when we all came together, the, the brethren, and I'm not trying to identify them as just convention center brethren because they're among us, we're together, so we're, it's we. But just to know who I'm talking about, that group of brothers, except for who may have changed, but they did not even believe in Matthew 27, 52 resurrection. They don't, they don't see the thief on the cross resurrected. They don't see anybody resurrected in the early church. Uh, so that's, that's, a, that's a, a separate factor that we're having to work in the ministry to work that. Uh, I don't think anyone that was came up on this side of the brethren since the six, 1965, I don't think any of us, uh, that wasn't part of our teaching, but it has been theirs. So there's still several things that, you know, we, we still have to come to an understanding on, and it's going to take God to help us, no question about that. Uh, but getting back to the tares and the wheat and, and the chaff, you know, chaff has to be a part of the wheat. I mean, it's part of what produced the wheat. So you almost have to look at chaff as being the human nature that has been born again, the inner man. And out of this inner man is like, uh, that's the seed of wheat. That's wheat. Uh, it's, it's just a wheat stalk, but it, it, as long as it's connected uh, and rooted to the Lord, it will bring forth uh, uh, fruit in harvest. So, but God doesn't need the chaff, which is all of the things that's working in you as a born again uh, child of God that's going to produce the fruit, the, the final uh, phase of maturity, the, the man-child, to finally come to a place where you've reached perfection. That's wheat. That's, the, that's the, the, the wheat harvest. That's where the seed of wheat, the fruit of wheat, uh, is finally produced. The chaff will be done away with. Not, God don't need that anymore. Once he's produced out of the inner man, the until we all come to the fullness of Christ. So once we come to the fullness of Christ, there is no more chaff. There's not any chaff can inherit eternal life. I can tell you that. But it is part of what produces wheat. Where tares, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because of this word here in the sixth verse, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. See, uh, here, a little while later, he's going to say that uh, if God don't chasten you, you're an illegitimate child. You're, in other words, you're not, and, 
and I've always said a chaff cannot be a child of God. Okay, it's not wheat. But I'm thinking we may have to, I may have to adjust that because um, the Adamic nature, the flesh that the old man that's not born of God, you know, you you got two natures in you once you're born again. You got the nature of God, which is this wheat production that's taking place in your life, but you've also got the fallen nature of Adam. And that I would I think you could say that is a tear. It, it's not wheat. And it can't be wheat, and it can't be saved. So if you take a child of God that's born again, and it's God's child, it would have to be in the harvest that, look, God said, don't, don't remove the tares. Because if you remove these tares, you're going you're gonna to destroy some wheat. So... You know, if God tried to destroy the Adamic nature in you before you actually had it fully overcome, and then it's not just overcoming the Adamic nature, but it's developing in this process of wheat production, the, the, the stalk of wheat, the seed of wheat that you receive when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But if you turned on God in the harvest. Now let's let's say if if you turned and you you made up your mind you weren't going to say serve God, then I would say, and there's there is an illegitimate child. This child that's not of God or the Adamic nature that's in you, if you give over to that, you will be burned in eternal judgment. And you. I think you would have to be numbered with the tares that you finally gave over to that and you were judged eternally when you did. That's <clears throat> the, uh, you remember Jesus said that uh, you can speak against Christ but you can't blaspheme, you can't blaspheme the Spirit of God. If you did, it's unforgivable. He he could understand, you know, that <clears throat> you could, and Brother Leninger always put that this way. He said, um, you can't commit that kind of sin until there is eternal judgment set up, the judgment seat of Christ. But if you reject Christ <clears throat> after he's presented everything to you that he can present, a sevenfold life, his full manifestation, and you reject that, <clears throat> you, 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 you've entered, you know, eternal judgments got you. And that's where he calls that sore punishment. It's a worse punishment. It's the ultimate of God's punishment, where God rejects you. Uh, so anyway, uh, here he says in verse 7, if you endure chastening, <clears throat> God dealeth with your sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you Bastards and not sons. That's a tough word, but it's in the Bible. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our own flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection of the Father of spirits and live? For they verily, <clears throat> for a few days, chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers. <clears throat> of his holiness. So here, and that's what a tear does. A tear rejects chastening. A tear will not be chastened. They won't stand for, for the Lord to correct them and chasten them. 
But if you love God and you understand God's dealings, you'll endure God's chastening. Um, and he does it differently than our fathers here on this earth <clears throat> who they chastened us after what they felt like we should be. But God in heaven, he chastens us for our own profit. I've often said he, he, he is not interested in just being a big boss. God's not, that's not God. <clears throat> he just wants you to be righteous and he wants me to be righteous. He just wants us to learn righteousness. And if it takes correction or even chastening, <clears throat> then we should understand that God is, is helping us, even if it takes chastening. <clears throat> Y'all have heard, you know, I've heard several preachers in the body say, you know, they'd use the allegory, you know, if I'm standing on the railroad track and a train's coming, well, uh, tell me to get off of the track that a train's coming. I said, if I won't listen to you, push me off the track. But if you if you can't take a if you can't push me off the track, then take a club and knock me off the track. <laughs> I've heard several preachers use that allegory. You know, well, you know, we, in other words, we ought to want. I've told the Lord more than one time. I've said, God, I'd say it this way. Sometimes I say, Lord, be easy on me but chastise me if you have to <laughs> help me, whatever you got to do to make me righteous. I want to be righteous. So, but you don't have to say, God, make it easy on me because he is, he's a tender savior. He he's, he's peaceable. He's full of love and a lot of grace, a lot of mercy. And so, you know, when I first learned this message, you know, when I first started hurt hearing this message, well, I started looking for over my shoulder all the time, wondering what God fixing to do to me, you know. But I finally quit that. And uh, because now I know that I'm serving God and I have no intentions of not serving or quit serving him. But I do realize that there's areas in my life that he he's working on and that I need to continue uh, in this race. And <clears throat> so, but I've learned that when I'm on the mountain, just to enjoy the mountain experience because there is a valley coming. And when it, get, when it gets to be a valley, that's when we got to get out to brass tacks. But when God's got you on the mountain, don't worry, don't, don't destroy your mountaintop experience worrying about the next valley. Just go ahead and enjoy where God's got you and he's blessing you. And right now, he don't have you in a, in a valley. He's not putting a lot of pressure on you. Enjoy that. But when he starts putting pressure on you, then get sober and solemn and realize, you know, God's dealing with my life. And I right now, he's wanting more out of me. It's time that for me to, to move up a little bit in the Lord or he wouldn't be dealing with me like this. So... Uh, so in verse 12, here he says, With, wherefore lift up hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet. Least that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, least any man fail of the grace of God, least any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Least there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who from one morsel of meat sold his birthright. You know, you don't have to be an Esau. You can sell, you can sell your birthright to this new covenant for a very meager thing if you're not careful. You can get you know, you can get down in the mully grubs and you can think, woe is me and I'll never be able to do this. Well, you can't do it. It's going to take God to do it in you. You just got to learn how to yield to it. 
For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. For you are not come, and he finishes this chapter up this way, unto the mount that might be touched, that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness of temper, tempest. He's talking about when Moses went up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, you know, on the sound of the trumpet, the voice of words, which voice that they that heard entreated that the world, that the word should not be spoken unto to them anymore, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it should be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But now he says, but you, you are not under the law going through the wilderness and going through that experience of God manifesting himself in such a magnificent and terrible way on that mountain that went up to Horeb and Moses got the Ten Commandments on. But he said, but you are come to Mount Zion and into the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. That's, that's the New Testament. That's not Jerusalem, the natural Jerusalem, but the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. And to an innumerable company of angels or messengers to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to the God, the God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Um, Maybe right here we could uh, look at Second um, Corinthians four. Um, <clears throat> let me back up so that you can get a because we were talking about Moses going up and getting the Ten Commandments and that mountain that burned with fire and that trembled and men were so afraid they 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 didn't want to they didn't want to talk to God. They said, Moses, you just go and come back and tell us. When he got back, his face shone so bright that they had to put a veil over his face. He had to put a veil. They couldn't look on him. <clears throat> Here it says, seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded. For unto this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. He's, he's showing that about the Jews that, they still, they still have a veil over their face. They still can't see Christ. They're still reading the Old Testament and they don't see which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, the Lord is that spirit where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Y'all have always heard that scripture. But in context, what he's saying is, is that until you see that Christ is the Messiah and the New Testament church is the body of Christ and that it has to be restored in our day, you will be set at liberty. Until then, you've got a veil over your face. You can't see it. But the spirit of the Lord is liberty. And once God, you're liberated, like the, the apostle Paul, when he was Saul of Tarsus and on the road to Damascus, putting 
the children of God and the body of Christ in prisons and hunting them down like dogs to try to stop this movement of Christ. And God knocked him down on the road to Damascus and blinded him to show him how blind he was or what veil was over his face. He didn't see Christ. He was an anti-Christ Jew. But once God opened his eyes, the Spirit of the Lord gave him liberty to be able to see. That's what that scripture is actually meaning in context. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So we're, you know, Paul said it this way, we're looking through a glass darkly. But the more we're seeing, the more uh, clear it gets. And God reveals himself more to us. Uh, it's, it's not, we're not seeing things so darkly. Therefore, chapter four here, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. This is Paul talking. But we've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, least the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine unto them. That word God right there should be a capital G. The God of this world is God Almighty himself. And he's the one that blinds your minds when you don't believe. If you don't believe, then God puts a veil over your face. That's the whole context of this whole chapter. And so here it's just good to bring this in with uh, the 12th chapter of Hebrews, uh, where he was talking about, you know, that we, we didn't come through the, the wilderness and the shaking of the, of the Mount Zion itself, the true Mount. But he said, now you've come to a heavenly Jerusalem, you know, this new covenant, Mount Zion, the church, the body of Christ. But I just thought I'd bring this out because so many people think the God of this world is sin or evil, and the God of this world is God. And, and if you get the context of this, it could be no one else but God himself. He's the one that blinds minds. Uh, John 12, 40 here says, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted as I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. See, God's the one that blinded these eyes. So, and uh, he's the God of this world. The earth is his, his and all that there is therein, therein. So anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in for extra measure here tonight. Brother Smith. Yes, sir. Um, in Hebrews, uh, where he said, you're coming to the spirit of just men made perfect, mm -hmm. there in Hebrews 12, is, um, that's 12, 23. Is that the man child, those just men made perfect? Yes. Yes, it is. He's... He's this, well, he, what he's saying here is you've come to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, which is the body of Christ. And that's where he's the judge of all. And that's where the spirit of just men are made perfect in that place, in that heavenly Jerusalem. That's, I would say that you could say that you've entered into the marriage supper. You, you, you've entered into the marriage and you've joined up with Christ in a covenant, in a marriage covenant. He could not, he could not marry as long as he was alive. He could not marry again on the day of Pentecost because 
he was married in covenant to Israel under the law. But when he died on the cross, he was able to come back on the day of Pentecost and marry the church in a new covenant. And so, uh, and so there's the bride, the church. And Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling, speak better things than that of Abel, seeing that you refuse not him that speaketh, for he that escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. That's talking about the church. He's not just shaking the earth like he shook it naturally on the day of, uh, or in the wilderness on Mount Horeb or Mount Zion where he got the Ten Commandments. But here he, he said, and this word yet once more signified the removing of those things that are shaken as of the things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. In other words, God is going to shake everything. If it can be shaken, it'll be shaken. I, my wife reminded me just the other night, I can't remember what we were talking about, but she said, well, I'm there. I'm, I, I, re, I know what you teach. She said, you teach if you can be hurt, you need to be hurt. Well, that's a strong statement. But the reason I've always said that is, is, if God can shake you, in other words, if God lets you go through something that I used to tell, like for an example, when my wife was young and we were in the ministry, uh, it's not easy being a pastor. And uh, so women, pastors' wives suffer quite a bit because a lot of times people will take things out on the pastor's wife that they don't. Uh, that they want to say to the pastor or take out on him, but they won't, but they'll take it out on his wife. You know, I've had people say things and do things to my wife that they wouldn't dare do to me. Uh, and I feel sorry for her at times because of that, but it's part of it. And so when we were young and being pastors, a lot of times she would put up a shield. She's tired of getting hurt. She'd just say, I ain't getting hurt no more. And I tell her, you need, you got to take your shield down. You're going to have to take that down. If you can be hurt, you, you just have to suffer being hurt until you get to a place that you understand that it's the flesh in those people that's doing what they're doing to you. It's not, it's not God. That's, that's not the Jesus side of them. It's a different part. That's that uh, Adamic nature. And and you just, I had a preacher tell me this one time, and it, it helped me so much. He said, you're going to have to learn how to take things that offend you and just brush them off your shoulder just like it's a little bug. He said, you can't sit around and worry about stuff like that. Let things eat on you and, and hinder you. You got to get to a place that you realize right away that this is of God or it's not. Or God may be allowing it, but when when people are doing you wrong, you just got to brush that off. You can't dwell on that. You you dwell on that, it'll turn into bitterness and it'll destroy you. That's what we read a minute ago. That uh, where was that scripture at? Uh, it's on up a little ways. Uh, Now, let me see here. Somebody find that. Turn to, it's, it, it's bitterness in this chapter where many men. Um, here, let's just find it. Verse 15, Brother Smith. Verse 15? Yes. Okay. Looking diligent, yeah, at least any man fell of the grace of God, least any root of bitterness 
springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. So you can let <clears throat> an offense trouble you to a point that it turns into bitterness and it'll defile you, it'll destroy you if you let it. <clears throat> okay, back to verse 28 says, wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably and reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. We read that again. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. See, it's been shook. Till whatever's in it, it can't be shook anymore. Let us, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For God is a consuming fire. So it is judgment, and you know we've been working on that here in the last few years. That God's judgment is not bad for God's people. You know we've said it's informative, it's in, it's instructive, it's um, investigative. God's judgment, He first starts out giving you information, then He instructs you. The word of God will give you instruction. Preachers, God's ministers will give you instruction of the word of God of what, how to live right, how to be saved. And then, <clears throat> then God, he will investigate you. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. God, God, God can watch your spirit, know everything there is to know about you. And we're pretty well trained in the body of Christ where you can watch somebody's spirit and discern them pretty well because we've, we've been a student of that for so long. So God's investigative. I mean, the preacher can be up preaching and all of a sudden he'll hit you or me and, and God will, in, he, he'll, he'll bring something up. Maybe I didn't even realize I had really working in my life that God wanted me, he wanted to correct me of it. And so he investigates you. He'll, 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 he'll dig things up in your life. He'll manifest things in your life that you may have didn't even know they're there. In fact, I, yeah, I know for a fact. I was listening to Brother Leninger the other day. He said things like, uh, you better believe that, brethren. <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord, beloved, you better believe that is. Well, <clears throat> uh, and then it's not only investigative, it's corrective, a corrective judgment. And then it's um it's a chastising judgment. It will chast God will, he chastises those who he loves. So do you think God loves you? If, you? if you do, well, then you just you just need to know God's going to whip you once in a while. He, he's slow about it. He's, he's so merciful and tender. He's slow about it. But if you don't think God can get fed up with a, with a man's spirit, just, just go read the book of Jeremiah and see where God, he was so sick of, of Judah and Israel that he said, they can cry to me all they want to. I ain't going to listen to them. <laughs> but, he, but then he'd turn around and say, but if they, if they would really humble themselves and really repent, I, wouldn't, I, would, I would deliver them from this. But they never did. But he was tired of them. He was tired of it. He cast out. He, he put a terrible judgment on them. And, of course, you know, it, it became worse than that in AD 70. God finally judged that nation and, and uh, cut them off and turned to the Gentiles. Uh, that scripture in, in uh, I think it's in 2 Corinthians 2. I like this scripture right here because it, 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 it gives me, it makes my point that God's judgment 
for God's people is a righteous judgment of holiness that brings us to a place of righteousness. He says right here in 2 Corinthians 2, 13, said, now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and make manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Think about that. God, now this was in a restored, this was in a divine order of God in the early church. So we're not exactly in this place yet, but I, I say it's coming in a restored church that he's going to cause us to triumph in Christ and make manifest the savor of his knowledge. See, the savor, the, the, the truth of God, the knowledge of God's word is going to triumph wherever God sends his ministry in the restored church in every place every place that he sends us. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that are that perish. Then he explains that to the one we're a savor of death unto death. Those that are dead in sin and they won't hear God and they won't respond to God's word then it will judge them unto second death, eternal death. They're already dead, but they won't respond to God or the message of God. So now they're going to go into eternal death. They're going into second death because they will not respond to God. And to the other, the savor of life unto life. Those that are alive unto God, that wheat stalk I'm talking about, it will produce all the way to eternal life. This same judgment works both sides of the track. It, 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 will, it will eternally judge those that are unworthy, and it'll also eternally judge those that are worthy. One is worthy of second death, and the other one's worthy of eternal life. And who is sufficient? For these things, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God speak we in Christ. I, I love that little setting of scripture right there. It proves the point that God's judgment is a great judgment to those that will respond to it. It's a tender, wonderful judgment that will lead you unto life eternal. But if you won't listen to God and you've got a rebellious spirit, it'll destroy you. He is a consuming fire. So anyway, I just thought I would add that scripture in. Uh, I'll deal with the 13th chapter next time. We're, we're, it's right at 8 o'clock, and I don't want to um, take too much more time, but but I do, uh, I really appreciate all of the people of God. And these, you know, we're going to start our Wednesday night services back up. After the, the next week is the campground starts Monday night and it'll go through Friday night. So we won't have a Zoom meeting next Thursday night because I'll be at the campground. But when I come home the following week, we will be, uh, we'll have, uh, our Wednesday, regular Wednesday night service. And, uh, but I'm thinking I'll probably hang on to this Zoom, our Zoom meetings for a while, or maybe, maybe not ever put them down. I think there's a lot of benefit in these Zoom meetings that you just get down to the meat of the Word of God, so to speak, I think. Um, and uh, I think it's profitable myself. Uh, you know, I'm having Zoom meetings like this on Monday nights with the Dominicans and the, those in Mexico uh, that's on that Spanish Zoom meeting. And then I have this one on Thursday nights. And then I have on Saturday nights, I have a Zoom meeting for those in the Dominican Republic that are new pastors, new ministers. 
that are coming in, you know, because I'm trying to work with them with a, a foundation, you know, the history of the body, the history of William Souders, uh, the, the fact that uh, you have to start off with new people, the fact that the church fell away and that it has to be restored. And if the people don't see that, they'll never understand the word of God. And then you have to show them the church is going to be restored. And then Babylon, they've got to know what Babylon is. And they've got to see that God's going to get all his people out of that. Once you get them there, then you can take them to the reformation, uh, you know, of Protestantism, Pentecostalism, finally the body of Christ being established in America and how it's going out to different parts of the world today. And once they get there, they can pretty well jump in a meeting like this. You know, they 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 can get in uh, once they get a vision of what the body of Christ is about and the fact that we're restoring the church and that that's God's calling, then they, they're able to, to understand what we're doing, what we're talking about. But until then, they need the foundation that they know where they're at. There's so many people that come to the body of Christ. They'll come to the body of Christ two or three years, and they don't know where they're at. They don't know. They, they'll come to our services, but, you know, different things goes on in our worship. And then some churches don't even have Bible studies. Some churches just have worship services, and they do some teaching there, but it can take people years to figure out what the Bible, body of Christ is all about. Uh, there needs to be there needs to, you know, we've always had this saying, sheep bear sheep. We need some sheep to bear some sheep. We need some people that, you know, we're living in such a fast-paced society that it's difficult. It's difficult to, to, to find you a proselyte, you know, or someone hungry and then spend time with them and spoon feed them this message. It's difficult to do that today. Men work, they're, they're, they're wore out by the time they get off of work and they, they only have so much time to do their, you know, chores at home. And uh, it, I understand that it's, it's that the society we're living in, it's a fast paced society. And, uh, what I say the other day that we're living in a microwave world. And um, so Sister Durham told me that I, I, I had a crock pot message. And I said, I'm a crock pot preacher. That's what I am. She, she didn't mean that bad. She was just saying, you know, I, I went slow enough that she could get it. Get the savor out of that slow cooking. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's what I told her. I said, I'm going to start telling people I'm a crock pot preacher. You know, I got a crock pot message. This ain't a microwave message. I can't, I can't do, I can't handle it for you in 30 seconds or a minute or even four or five minutes. You know, it's just, it's too big. This is too big a message. Anyway. Um, before we go tonight, let's have prayer together. Thank God for the word of God. And then let's remember these that are needful in prayer. Um, uh, Sister Crafton, you know, I, I said some things the other night, other day about her being stubborn, but I was really just going on with her. Uh, I know she needs a touch from God in her life. And my point was, is the fact that, you know, some of us are young and we have something wrong in our body physically that I don't think God always just puts that there. I think some things happen to us genetically. Ecclesiastes says that chance happens to all men. So 
that's one of the things you got to realize about God. Sometimes God, he may deal with you he, with chastisement. He may deal with you with correction. But then I think there's some things that happens to us that's just by chance. And God can remove the things that we endure by chance. But I believe sometimes God just says, I'll watch that. You know, I you, give you that scripture in Proverbs a minute ago. The candle of the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. So I think God sometimes watches us. He watches our spirit. He watches how we go through things, how we go through life, whether it's good or bad. I mean, we, my wife and I, we just finished reading the book of Jeremiah. We're, we're reading uh, the chronological Bible. And, um, you know, when you read, I mean, here Jeremiah doing everything God tells him to do. He's a true prophet of God. And one time they, they tied a rope around him and led him down into a dungeon that was full of mire. And they, they uh, finally, a man came to the king and said, that prophet Jeremiah's going to die down there in that dungeon if, we, if you don't get him out of there. So the king said, well, go, go get him out of there so he won't die. So they, they made a bunch of, tied a bunch of rags together and finally let them down in the dungeon and had, had Jeremiah put them rags underneath his armpits. And they pulled him up by them rags that they made ropes out of and pulled him up out of the mire. But he still, they still put him in the midst of the prison. <laughs> you know, I mean, here's a man of God. Here he's, he, God let him endure that. Uh, I'm sure that what he endured, you know, made him understand some things about the pain and suffering that God was going to put Israel through that humbled not only him, but that would humble them. But, uh, you know, he finally got out of that. They finally got him out of that. But anyway, of course, we're, that was the book of Jeremiah. We hadn't read the Lamentations, book of Lamentations, the crying prophet again. But my point is, is that God allows us sometimes to go through things that he's not punishing us for. He didn't put us on it. It just came. It just came through the process of life. But God didn't feel to remove it. And he just watched us in it. Remember, we read that scripture. He's going to shake everything that can be shaken. Sometimes God just wants to know, you know, can, what can you and what are you willing to endure things? Are you willing to be righteous even though you're enduring things that's not pleasant, things that are painful? I mean, I don't want to endure that, but I hope whatever I endure that my faith will stay in him. You know, that's what Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego told the king. He said, well, rather, whether God delivers us or rather we die in the fire, we ain't going to serve Baal. We're going to serve God, no matter if we live or die. And just remember this. There's a lot of worse things in life than dying. If you die unto the Lord. If you die faithful in the Lord, there's no better way to die. Nobody wants to die. I don't want to die. But this message has helped me. You know, I almost died in this last surgery I had. I knew I was in bad shape. But I never, I wasn't afraid of death. I, I'm just, I, you know, this message has caused me not to be afraid. If God takes you, you know, uh, and you you could die and maybe didn't have to. Jesus, isn't that what he told his disciples? Your time's always, but mine's not yet come. So I think you can live. I think you can die by chance. If But if you die in God, I do. I, I, I may have to talk to God about this, you know, if I make it when I get there. 
But I think there's times that I could have died that God sustained me. I think God sent an angel a few times that kept me from dying, that it wasn't God's will for me to die right then. But but I may have to talk to the Lord about that. He may just say, well, you just made it, son. I didn't step in. <laughs> you know, I may be thinking too high of myself. I don't know. Anyway, um, anyway, the Lord, uh, he's a good God. And no matter what you go through, the bottom line is, is that if you're God's child, he's sovereign and you're secure in God. As long as you're living faithful and a just life, I believe with all my heart you're secure and God will sustain you. If it, if not in this life, in a resurrection, he'll sustain you. And so if you do your part, he'll more than do his. Uh, okay, so let's pray for, I mentioned Sister Crafton. Um, and I think I made my point about her being younger and just having a problem in life in her health that, you know, it's just, I don't, I, I don't necessarily, I, I mean, she's had that. It came through her genetics and uh, I've told the Lord about her. I've said, Lord, you could just heal her. Uh, same way with Bill Daniels. I'd love to see God to heal brother Bill Daniels. And I'm still praying for him. I love that man. I think he's a good man. Uh, Brother Goss still needs our prayers up in Canada and the Keswick Church and the Goss family. Uh, my little uh, niece, Bonnie Garza, she's got pancreatic cancer. She's not doing good. Uh, but she's in this just in the last few weeks. She's received the Holy Ghost on her while she was on her sick bed. And so, you know, God's at least touching her. And if he takes her at this time, I think she'll be, I think she'll die in faith. What measure she has. And then um, Brother Emilio Green has a woman in, this is a pastor's wife in Igwe. And she's got cancer, but she she needs a treatment, but she don't have the money. Neither does she have insurance. And he's looking into that for me. I said, find out what it's going to take for that treatment. Let's see if there's some way I can get her some help. Um, and then Brother Green's sister, sister, her name is Florence. She's a sweetheart. Uh, she's older than him. And she's got diabetes. And they removed three of her toes because they couldn't get them to heal. But they finally, yesterday, had to put her in the hospital and cut her foot off on that side. And so if you would play for her, her husband has been bedfast with diabetes. He's got both legs cut off up to the knees. And he's been bedfast for about three years and she takes care of him. I mean, he doesn't even have a bed sore on him. I mean, she cares for him, but now she's not going to be able to care for him. So her daughter took her home, took him home with her, and she's taking care of him for right now. Anyway, it's Brother Green's sister, Sister Florence. Um, Gary Wright, Brother Gary Wright in Humble, Texas, really needs her prayers. He's home, or at least he was. Um, he was Monday. No, no, he didn't go home till Tuesday, but he's going to have to go right back in the hospital. But um, uh, anyway, they let him go home for a few days because I think they'd done all they could do for him at that time. So keep praying for Brother Gary Wright in Humble, Texas. What else? Can anybody else mention Sister Crow? What else do we need to pray for? Remember uh, the Stein family, Sister Bonnie Dodge, her family and their loss. Yes, Bonnie Dodge. Um, her daughter was married to Zach Stein, who, who was 36 years old, I believe. 
that just recently drowned in an accident um, while they were just swimming, playing in the river. And uh, so they just buried him. That's been very hard on them. I saw on the news something just yesterday about Donald's dying. I don't know if that's any kin or not, but I didn't get any information. It just, it was, but it was something that, uh, you know, it didn't sound good. It, it sounded like there's something that happened. That, but anyway. Brother Smith, that was Zachary's dad that in our, comes to our church and helps out. That yeah, was that drowned. That was Zach's time. It, yeah, yeah, his dad. But I didn't know this other Stein I heard on the news that it, or any connection or not. So I just threw that out in case somebody you know who knew something about it or heard it or whatever. But I had I don't know any more than what I just said. Sister Donna uh, Henderson, her son Dylan, yes, uh, was sick today. Okay, and of course Donna and Ann. Estrada, they just lost their mother just about a month ago. And so I know they, you know, would really appreciate us still praying for them and the family. All right. If everyone would, well, I know if you want to raise your hand for your unspoken request, we'll go ahead and raise it. I'm sure everybody's got one or many. But if you'll turn on your, turn your microphones off, We'll pray together. Thank you, Lord. Oh, God. Praise Not our will, Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your great mercy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 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 Amen. 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 Praise God. Hallelujah. Stop. And I'll.